uh, this. And I said, I'm on the radio. And I said, I couldn't answer the question. And I said, give me a quick, short version of it. And he did. Uh, and so it's based on economic growth, and it's a consumer price index times the budget expenditures. Now, there's no severance tax uh, that is included in on that, but uh, at that point, it can trigger and reduce taxes up to 10%. It can't never exceed that. Uh, but say, for instance, that severance tax prices are up and everything, that does it. Does or severance taxes are up, excuse me, that doesn't trigger anything. But let's say that we were in an inflationary environment and that word sales tax, you're collecting a lot more because of that environment. That will actually make it so that it triggers and then makes it so it goes back. And we that sales tax is one of the best economic indicators there is out there. So that that is the very short version of it. But it's making it so that if our revenue are coming from the personal income tax and the sales tax and, and other things, but not the severance, then we've got a true economic growth indicator that allows us to reduce the personal income tax even further. The severance tax was a concern for many people when they were looking at the revenues that the state had in surplus. So oh, I've watched it for the years mm -hmm. uh, for the, the, that I've been here where severance tax drops out, and we got to cut the budget $200 million. There's all, been all kinds of nightmares, and we got to get off that roller coaster and be just on a consistent escalator while still growing our state. But you want to give back to the people. You want to make it so that their, their lives are better. And so this is the sweet spot. I'm very proud of what we got done on that. All right, let's talk about the uh, Eastern Panhandle and infrastructure. I know the Senate president is in charge of the Senate for the entire state and all the citizens of the state as well. But you do understand the Eastern Panhandle's issue better than most because you live here and you're from here. So let's talk about traffic. Let's talk about the shape of ID one, which is horrible. Let's talk about Route nine, which is congested. Let's talk about the schools, which are rapidly getting overcrowded as growth continues to come to the Eastern Panhandle. Craig. What can the state do to help the infrastructure issues of these three counties? Wow. What a way to depress somebody. <laughs> uh, and the thing about it is, is that we are of, of one of the very few growth areas there is of in the state, uh, but that's changing. Uh, now, did you, you say that Interstate 81 – is terrible. Well, it's gone from two lanes to three lanes, and resources have been put in there uh, for the, to, to be able to get, get the paving done. Now, to, granted, I haven't been on 81 now for two months, so maybe things have changed a little bit, uh, but to a greater degree, the construction of making it three lane is going to get completed. Uh, but let's not forget about the roundabouts that have been going in, that it is improving the traffic flow. And I know some people don't like roundabouts, but I can tell you this much. All you have to do is look over your left shoulder. If there's nothing coming, you can proceed. And there's no traffic backups up there from that. But there is a lot of road construction going on. And, and, but th th that's, that's a good thing. Uh, from that standpoint, when it comes to the water and sewer, uh, we've moved $25 million from the state, getting ready to move another $25 million specifically to Berkeley County. Uh, and then look at the economic development, commercial metals, Procter & Gamble, uh, Clorox, uh, just to name a few. And we're not even talking about the small ones, uh, small businesses like I used to own. Of uh, that are prospering in, in in the eastern panhandle, so it's it's a, uh, a great thing. To, I, I I think we live in the best part of the whole state, and and we're doing everything that we can to get the roads better. Now, locality pay didn't make it across the finish line once again, or differential pay, whatever. You, but it's coming to a head. I'm telling you. Uh, we're going to be able to manage that here before much longer. We can manage it in the Senate. Uh, the House delegates, again, is where the logjam is on being able to, to get that taken care of. Working on state police, uh, Nate Harmon called me uh, 
last night, I think it was, and uh, well, actually, he got me the information last night. He called me the day before and told me that uh, we, we've got a, still a shortage, and they're changing the formula on 911, and uh, I've got a meeting on with the governor's chief of staff on Monday, and we're going to solve that. Right now, he's in Qatar. Uh, or cutter, whichever way you want to call it, uh, with the guard. And as soon as he's back, we're going to get that aspect of it taken care of. So there is advantages to having the Senate president from the Eastern Panhandle for the Eastern Panhandle. Make things happen. And you know what? It wouldn't happen if I'm sitting back home and not having the day-to-day contact with the executive and with all these agencies. Anything on Route 9 you can share with us, Greg? On... To nine west or Hedgesville, nine he- yeah, Hedgesville to Berkeley County. I mean, to a Morgan there, County. There's nothing to share with you at this point in time. All right, is uh, is is and anything being actively considered to improve Route Nine? I know uh, Delegate Mike Kite has been on the show in the past and talked about uh, the frustration that people have as they travel that road, and people they need a little glimmer of hope. Anything. The answer is yes, okay? But I'm not bothered by talking about this right now. Let me do my job, okay? We're we're working on being able to do it. But remember uh, that it's... That's a, that's a lot of money to be able to get, and you got to get over mountains uh, to be able to do it. And and it's not just that; it's uh, getting down there by the VA center and, and taking the new nine east uh, and stopping that congestion at uh, the lows in the commons area uh, out there. You know, to a third of that traffic or more what could veer off and go. To out by the airport and get on 81 to go south and allow for greater expansion there. I, took, I was a lowly little delegate in the minority when I told them it was a dumb idea what they were doing there. But they didn't listen. And so it's a train wreck out there. I recognize that. And, uh, and, but I recognized that long before even – the engineering department over the Department of Highways. So that work needs to be done there as well. And uh, if you were able to build uh, a new line uh, from Tabor Station to and connect it to the bypass on 522, that would open up uh, Back Creek Valley. It would open up Morgan County, which, by the way, Berkeley County's went from what, 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 we, what do we grow? Uh, Three to four thousand people a year, if not more. Uh, but Morgan County is exactly the same as what they were uh, 20 years ago. You need to be able to spread this out. You need to be able to spread out the economic opportunities to come along with that. And so, that I'm not going any further than that. You can tell by what I've just told you that I'm. All, very, very aware of the situation and in trying to get it addressed as best we can. John. I want to go back to locality pay. Is there an element of the locality pay proposals that would decrease, in regard to teachers in particular, but others, that would decrease existing salaries in the more far, far-flung region, or is it just about raising the salaries on, on the, the border counties? Just about raising it. Uh, if you decrease, to, we, we have problems with getting people to go to places where nobody wants to go. So why is okay. it not a slam dunk? I don't understand why locality pay, when there is such a, a drain from the neighboring states uh, on on these uh, on these professions. I what what is the nature of the resistance to locality pay? Bolt down in one sentence, we don't have enough growth areas in the state of West Virginia right now to be able to get it done, okay? Uh, for the people represent their areas. And so would they do, why would you vote for a pay raise for somebody in the eastern panhandle and not vote for a pay raise for the very people that are working in your district that have shortages or whatever it may be? So – You need to have more growth areas in the state of West Virginia. And this is exactly 
why when I bark through all the investment that we're working on getting here and getting those jobs, you're turning Mason County is going to be turned into a, a growth area, and it was not before because of the new core investment. Jackson County is going to get growth again because of the investments that's coming in there. Morgantown area, thank goodness, it, it, it is a growth area. And by the way, uh, we put $50 million into the budget uh, for the 73rd Cancer Treatment Center in this country, National Cancer Treatment Center, where it's going to be up in Morgantown in West Virginia, is going to, we already have a high cancer rate, but now instead of having to go outside the state to get experimental treatments and be, be part of it, West Virginia is going to be the 73rd. It's a big deal. It's one of the unsung heroes of what we did this year. But I answered your question. Yeah, I, I guess, but not really. I don't understand where the, my, for the representatives of the the uh, I don't know Mon County I, I hate I, I don't want to name specific counties because I'm not that familiar with with where they are but in in coal country where the the value of of a home what you could buy for eighty thousand dollars there is going to cost you two hundred twenty five thousand dollars in Berkeley County I, it just seems to me that the locality pay is is a no brainer and I, I, no, I, I it's a no brainer when you understand it. Okay, uh, the haves d- 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 are outnumbered by the have-nots. Uh, okay, and that's the way this process works down here. And so, that it, if you do a pay raise for the uh, or, or a locality pay like that, then they want it for their area also. And I can't say that I frankly blame them, but it's not a good way of doing business. But especially in the House delegates, they're on the ballot every two years. That is going to force them, and it's designed that way by our founding fathers, to be closer to the people and to be able to represent the people from their area. And their area are saying, well, we want it too. Okay, shifting gears again. Um how dead is Amendment 2? Do you think that there's going to be a re-edited, massaged, better marketed form of Amendment 2 coming in the future? Uh, I, let's put it this way. You can see that the Senate is committed long term to getting rid of the personal property tax of on – well. We're fully committed on automobiles. It's right there. We're going to, but uh, 50% on the equipment, machinery. The big companies that come in uh, get uh, agreements, policy agreements, uh, that of avoid that tax. Of uh, if we're going to fix our state long term, so that we've got more haves than have nots, and be able to grow it, that needs to go away. Is it going to happen uh, anytime soon? I don't think so. There's no, I have no desire to have another election to deal with that. We're, we're set on a course right now. But you'll be able to see that the state's going to be able to afford to be able to do this. And if we can get ourselves in another flatline budget environment and save up the money to be able to get that across the finish line, again, that would be an ideal situation uh, if you want more jobs to come to McDowell County and Wyoming County, Raleigh County, and places like that. Uh, so it's not dead. But the concept, the economics of it, uh, is uh, doesn't change. Okay, that does not change, and so we're doing everything we can to, again to keep the momentum and to grow our state. And I anticipate that somewhere in the future, it might not be while I'm alive, uh, but we will put ourselves on a course to where we finally recognize that that needs to come off the books. Uh, it's I'm, I have to admit that I'm disappointed, and uh, the, it would have passed. Uh, all the amendments would have passed if the uh, governor wouldn't have went out uh, and teamed up with the National Education Association, which is or they're useless of uh, and and killed all four amendments. One of them is even practice right now. 
Senate President so. Craig Blair is our guest here on the program. Just a couple of minutes left, Craig, to get into PEIA, which was another thing that you had to address and find some type of workable solution for. How did you arrive at the, obviously a lot of math was involved. How did you arrive at the final bill? And you've got about well, three, three minutes. Craig didn't arrive at that one. That was uh, Senator Tom DeCubo and mm-hmm. uh, uh, Jeremiah Samples. Uh, who, that, that's why the governor got mad at me for hiring him when they got fired at the DHHR, but he's incredible. Uh, and remember, we did DHHR reform. Jeremiah Samples was working for the House and the Senate to be able to get these things across the finish line. And by the way, the PIA and the $2,300 pay raise and the tax uh, reduction of t- t- is all part of a three-legged stool on being able to move forward. And PIA uh, was anticipated of going forward and by the time we were to 2028 to being over a half billion dollars underwater reminiscent to workers comp for that matter and we've now changed the direction of that of and yep spousals of you'll you can still get a spouse can still get PIA, but if you get it at your work first or, or at your if your job offers it, you should go there. Now, you don't have to, but you're going to pay 100% just like legislators do. The 80-20 match, whereas the state pays 80% and the employee pays 20%, is now reinstated. And we had a lot of federal contract employees that – the money comes in from the feds. It goes into, say, the DHHR's budget, but yet they're on PIA. We have gotten away from that so far that we weren't drawing down tens of millions of dollars from the federal government, and we were putting it on the backs of the West Virginia taxpayers. And then you had – I'll tell this story. I was at uh, – I only have about a minute. Okay, I was at the health plan, and uh, I was telling the story about the spousal part of it, and uh, I got in the elevator, and one of the employees uh, there told me, he goes, I'm one of those people, my wife's a teacher, and but they sell insurance. They sell health insurance, and that was what their, his business they worked at, but he was on PEIA. you got to be kidding me. And he told me, he goes, I'm going to ride this horse as long as you let me. Okay, we do not need to be subsidizing businesses with West Virginia PIA. We need to be making sure that our employees are taken care of in the best they possibly can. That's the and so we got it to the sweet spot on that. All right, now so on that there you go. On that note, you came in under a minute, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate the full hour, Craig. Thank you very much.